Last week on Capturing Christianity, Cameron Bertuzzi hosted a Dr. Dustin Crummett with the promise that he could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Catholicism is false. My reaction to Dr. Crummett's claims next, but first, as always, we start with our mission. Always remember, God created us for this time and for this place. If we learn this faith, if we live this faith, if we share this faith, what will the next 100 years look like? Join the mission. Um, so I know what you're thinking. Where's Matt? Where's Trent? Who, who's this guy? Well, Matt is off the internet for the whole month. Trent's busy doing a free-for-all Friday thing on chess. So you guys, you're stuck with me today. I'm pinch hitting. I'm Brad Shapizzi. While you're here, why don't you hit the like button and, and subscribe and, and we'll get started refuting Dr. Crummett's proof against the Catholic Church. I first learned about Cameron Bertuzzi on Pints with Aquinas. Matt was really impressed with Cameron's channel, Capturing Christianity, and took a personal interest in Cameron's pursuit of Catholicism. Matt arranged a meeting between Cameron and Dr. Scott Hahn, and then Trent Horn and Jimmy Aiken. So I think many of us started following Cameron's walk with, with great enthusiasm. I think it reminded all of us of those times when each of us first discovered the beauty of this faith and how that beauty drew us into a deeper relationship with our Lord. But unfortunately, on a recent program on his channel, Cameron hosted a Dr. Dustin Crummett who claimed to, well, the title of the video is how Catholicism can be proven false. And, and Cameron introduces him stating that it's not actually clickbait. You might have thought that as you were coming into this video, but it, it is not clickbait. There's a way th to interpret this that actually like, so the guy that I have on, Dustin, Dr. Dustin Crummett, he thinks that we can actually prove that Catholicism is false beyond a reasonable doubt. And because of the work of Matt Frad and Dr. Hahn and, and Trent and Jimmy, I just think this claim, obviously it's not true, and Dr. Crummett does, does not come anywhere close to fulfilling it. And he knows it. He admits in, in his opening statements, acknowledging that his arguments have been refuted a million times. But nevertheless, some of the claims he make seem to have had a significant impact on Cameron. And I, I think there's just something, something sad, like, like disappointing. You hate to see someone's enthusiasm crushed, and I would say needlessly crushed. Also, because Dr. Crummett's claim that Catholicism can be proven wrong, because this claim is so strong, if, if this is left unchallenged, then some people might just assume that the statements are accurate. Dr. Crummett says multiple times that his positions are not controversial and that they are the mainstream view in academia. I will say, in my defense, I think where this is applicable, what I'm going to say is like not very controversial among the relevant experts. So the things I'm going to say about history, for instance, I think are not really actually very controversial among mainstream historians, including lots of Catholic historians. Um, so uh, I think if people look into kind of the mainstream academic stuff about this, they're going to find just a more detailed version of what, what I've said. So he sets up his positions as the authoritative view. If I disagree with them, then, it, then it's my fault. I'm outside the mainstream. But even so, he gives almost no sources at all. He, he makes, I think, two references to contemporary writers that he agrees with. So at the end of the day, you just have to take his word for it that this is the mainstream view. And unfortunately, I, I fear maybe many people did. Cameron has quite a large following. So I think this issue of sources is important. Typically in academia, you don't make these types of claims without some kind of citation. So I Googled Dr. Crummett and I found his website and I emailed him asking him for some specific citations. I'm sure he's a busy man, but as of the recording of this video, I think it's been five days now, there's been no response. I'm not saying that he has no sources. I'm just saying that some of the things that he said did not square with me and, and I would like to have a chance to review his sources. But I think there's an ethical issue here. If you're gonna, if you're gonna make some significant accusations, then, Sorry. Then then maybe you ought to then maybe you ought to have something in your hand to point to that backs up what you have to I'm I'm sorry. My my dog has caught a cat. So how does Dr. Crummett approach proving Catholicism wrong? His method here is to throw so many details at you and hope something sticks. And it just might because 
Unless you've formally studied this stuff, the average individual might not have the full background knowledge to be able to discern the context, the meaning, and the circumstances of his claims. And I imagine many people might just, must, might just get overwhelmed and just take his word for it. He admits this is his strategy to overwhelm you with data. He says, by proof, he doesn't mean... When I talk about proof, I don't mean like something that's going to produce certainty of the sort that uh, you would get from, uh, you know, like a geometric demonstration or something like that. I mean, I think that it's it basically just winds up being compelling. It sort of settles the issue. Um, and when I talk about a proof, I don't mean uh, a single argument. So really what this is going to have the form of is something like a, a cumulative case. He says he believes that people abandon their worldviews when... What really I think causes people to abandon big worldviews is when you have a bunch of things that start kind of coming apart at the seams and, and not making sense, and then ultimately something gives. Um, so he makes his case in four domains, history, ethics, metaphysics, and curiously, internal consistency. And he brings up issues under each of those domains. So my plan here is to point out what I think are some glaring inconsistencies in the arguments that he'll make in one domain from arguments that he'll later make in others. I'm not gonna go over every issue that he raises here in this one video because it would get too long. I'm leaving some stuff on the cutting room floor. So maybe there could be a part two and, and probably a part three because there's a lot of stuff to address. The two goals I have for this video is to deal with his treatment of the Marian dogmas but also Dr. Crummett makes some in incomplete or maybe a bit misleading statements about burning heretics. And Karen seems to have really been affected by this. At one point, he expresses how much he, he wants to become Catholic. And then when Dr. Crummett makes these accusations, you can see in Cameron's body language how, how, how deflated he becomes. But before I get into those topics, I just want to address right off of the bat Dr. Crummett's statement about Catholic dogmas in general. It's a short clip, but I think it's important because I think this provides a foundation for everything that follows, everything that he will say, and all of my responses. There are just a lot of things that you have to believe if you're gonna be an Orthodox Catholic, and there's very little wiggle room. Very small clip, I know, but, but there's so much there. Dr. Crummett says that there is just a lot of stuff that you have to believe to be Catholic. But I'm going to take the opposite position. I'm going to argue that it is Protestants that are actually burdened with having so much stuff to believe. What I mean is that there's, there's so many options. Now, I've told this story before. Years ago, I attended a, a Bible study that was, that was at a Panera Bread, and it was hosted by the non-denominational assembly from right across the street. I was not only the only Catholic attending, I was the only person who did not, who did not belong to that community. And of course, for those of you who, who know me at all, I used the opportunity to express Catholic teaching. And honestly, that, that is probably why I was going in the first place. And I think they figured that out pretty quickly and started shutting me down. I would give my spiel and, and they would cut me off and say, all that stuff doesn't matter. All that matters is the essentials, what we can all agree on. But what were the essentials? All they could agree on in actuality was was the resurrection and, and to be nice to each other. So I thought it was very ironic because I personally observed that when topics came up like the death penalty or, or marriage or whatever, whatever came up that week, none of them, not one, not one agreed with another. There was this smorgasbord of beliefs being thrown around the table, conflicting biblical interpretations, pitting verses against verses, People making references to the interpretations of their favorite writers, pe people that I'd never heard of. But I found it so overwhelming how much stuff was being thrown around that table. If I had to start from scratch as a Christian in that group, I would, I would be completely lost. Great guys, but they were burdened with so many options of what to believe. Now, per perhaps that's not representative of every non-denominational non group. I don't know, but here's an analogy. A bunch of us are going to meet up later. Where are we going to meet up? Down the street. Have I told you a lot? No, I told you very little. Three words. You are required to believe of very little. Down the street. But the other guy, he asks specifically, where are we going to meet up? So I say, drive down the street. Go 35 miles per hour. Drive past Arius Lane. 
drive past Nestorius Way, turn right into the parking lot just, just after the donut shop. Veer to the right or else you'll hit that massive pothole when you get into the parking lot. Pull all the way around the building and park in front of the third blue door. I will be inside with tacos and donuts. Have I told you a lot? Yes. The word count was technically a lot more, but in actuality, because I was so specific, you are required to believe to know very little where we are going to meet up. Just one truth, the very specific location. But the first guy, on the other hand, was giving very unspecific, unspecific directions and consequently has nearly an infinite set of possible options. He can turn to the left, he can turn to the right, he can drive straight, he can speed, get a ticket, he can get a flat tire, he can go to the green door, the red door. I told him very little, but in reality, he's actually burdened with so much more. And God forbid he end up on Arius Lane or Nestorius Way. The fact that Catholic doctrine has developed does not mean that we have added to divine revelation. It means that it was refined, it was narrowed. When Arius tried to expand the understanding of Orthodox Christology, we held a council and we said no and we refined the teaching to eliminate his misunderstanding. We said, don't go left, go right, watch out for the pothole. Then again, with Nestorius, he tried to confuse the teaching, so we held a council and we refined the teaching to eliminate the possibility of his misunderstanding from being passed down through the ages. Like sharpening a blade, the manner in which the truth about Christ is expressed was sharpened. How did we do this? John chapter 16, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. This is sacred tradition, meaning that the truth was passed down and errors were eliminated. But historical revisionists make the claim that we added teaching. But that's not what the council documents themselves show. They are clear. They say, we mean this, we don't mean that. And anyone who says that, let him be anathema. So with that said, let's get into the Marian dogmas. So here's Dr. Crummett on Marian dogmas. Catholics are also required to believe some other very specific historical things. Um, for instance, things having to do with Mary, uh, the perpetual virginity of Mary, the assumption of Mary bodily into heaven. Um, and you can contrast the situation here with, say, the resurrection. Um, we know that belief in the resurrection began almost immediately, right? Um, if belief in the resurrection had begun 150 years later, that would be very suspicious. You'd wonder, like, did the early Christians not know about it? Did they not think it was important? Like, uh, and that's really sort of what we find with these, um, these Marian dogmas. Dr. Crummett explains that the lack of explicit references to the Marian dogmas in scripture is problematic. He argues that it is evidence that they were made up much later. He'll mention 70 years later. He'll mention 150 years later. Dr. Crummett's entire argument seems to be if these things were true, you would expect that they would be mentioned. He doesn't present any explicit evidence that they were made up. His entire argument seems to hinge on Scripture's supposed silence on these issues. Now, we'll deal with that supposed silence in a moment, but first, I would ask Dr. Crummett with respect if the Marian dogmas were explicitly stated in Scripture, would you believe them? If the gospel said Mary was perpetually a virgin, would you accept what Scripture says on that issue? It's an odd question, I know, unless you saw the entire interview, and if you did, then you know precisely where I'm going with this. Because much later in the discussion, Dr. Crummett admits that he does not truly believe what Scripture explicitly states. Fast forward to that clip. So, okay, here's the next one from Phoenix Baker. Thanks for your super chat, Phoenix. He or she says, aren't all similar arguments that Dustin brings uh, that Dustin brings brought against all types of Christianity, slavery and burning in the Old Testament, ethics in the Old Testament, historicity, etc. Yeah, so, I mean, my, my inclination, maybe I'll lose some people here, I don't know. My inclination is to agree with somebody like Randall Rouser. Uh, or with a lot of the early church fathers, actually, that some of these ethically problematic things in the Old Testament shouldn't be read at face value. Either they're mistakes or 
they're allegorical or they should be read in some much more complicated way. People can read Randall's recent book about this. Okay, so from Nathaniel Bennett, he says, just for clarity, is your position that the events described in Exodus didn't actually happen? Yeah, I, I think that there was some sort of historical basis, and I actually think that's quite credible on historical grounds. Um, I don't think that it could have happened exactly the way that it's portrayed in Exodus, right? Literally. So, so that's, that's my view. So would you take a, what, what kind of view of the Old Testament would you take then? Would you, would you, well, I mean, it seems like you'd have to deny inerrancy. Would you also deny inspiration or would you just say that God was sort of accommodating himself to Yeah, so the I, I think authors? what I, so in fact, I do deny inerrancy. So Dr. Crummett here argues that what scripture explicitly says is not historical and not inerrant. He even says in that first clip that this section of Exodus, which is which was being discussed at that moment, that that scripture might be a mistake. And I hope you caught that his basis for this view, his source, is a contemporary theologian named Randall Rouser, who lives now. Remember his problem with the Marian dogmas is that they were supposedly unknown until 70 or 150 years after the events? But this contemporary theologian, who is working now, I, I don't know who he is, but apparently he has presented a new belief thousands of years after the events occurred. Not, not 70, not 150, thousands of years. And Dr. Crummett subscribes to this new view, this new belief, that the events explicitly recorded in Scripture are not historical. For clarity here, the Catholic Church defined at Florence, Trent, and Vatican I that Scripture is inerrant. And Pope Leo XIII taught in his encyclical letter that's called On the Study of Scripture, that this inerrancy is not limited only to faith and morals. Some liberal theologians tried to argue that. It extends also to historical issues as well. Also, metaphorical interpretations may be completely legitimate. I, I don't dispute that. But it's in addition to literal interpretations. It, it doesn't supplant the literal interpretation. You can't erase the literal interpretation. Otherwise, the absurdity would follow that perhaps the whole Bible is metaphorical and none of it is literal. And this is why we don't refer to Origen as a saint Origen. He notoriously put too much emphasis on a spiritual sense of Scripture while rejecting the literal sense. Now, I, I haven't heard of Randall Rouser, but I think what's happening here is Dr. Crummett is employing a controversial interpretive method, a type of historical criticism known as form criticism which is universally considered to be speculative. You classify individual parts of scripture by their genre and then presume how that type of genre might have functioned within the society in which it was written. Then you can make judgments about the validity, the historicity, and the inerrancy of the text based on that presumption. And in this way, they will conclude that certain parts of scriptures are not historical, or that they're a legend, or that they're a myth. Pope Benedict XVI warned in his writing called Verbum Domine that some of these modern interpretive methods lead to denying historicity um, and that they cast doubt on the central mysteries of the faith. But my main point here is not regarding scriptural inerrancy. It's regarding the Marian dogmas. So again, back to my main question. If scripture explicitly stated that Mary was indeed a perpetual virgin, would that be evidence enough for you? Or is there another high, a higher bar that, that we would have to reach? Oh, by the way, that issue of ethics that Dr. Crummett mentioned in, in that clip, I'm going to address that in a bit. But first, I wanted to deal with this claim that the Marian dogmas are not present in scripture. First, the perpetual virginity of Mary. The, the New Testament evidence, to my mind, suggests that they think that Jesus has biological brothers, which would suggest that she was not a perpetual virgin. I mean, it talks about Jesus' brothers, and it never mentions that uh, uh, they're not his biological brothers. Here, Dr. Crummett makes references to isolated scriptures, such as Matthew 12, 46, which identifies certain individuals as brothers of Jesus. I'm going to argue here that one cannot isolate and interpret individual parts of Scripture in such a way that they would contradict the whole of Scripture. An important concept here is content of Scripture and unity of Scripture. 
You can't pit them against each other. And, that, and that's what will inevitably happen if you continue with Dr. Crummett's interpretive method. I'll explain. Scripture scholars are well aware of the many possible interpretations of this word brothers in Scripture. The word that we see here in our English translations, the word brother, sister, or brethren, the original Greek uses the word adelphos. And this word is commonly used throughout Scripture, not just for brother or sister, but also kinsmen, relatives, cousins, and nephews. The ancient Hebrew culture did not distinguish among these terms, and they did not have separate words for them. Catholic apologist Dave Armstrong, in a Biblical Defense of Catholicism on page 194, defines Adelphos and lists nine different ways that it is used throughout Scripture. Quote, Adelphos denotes a brother, a near kinsman. In the plural, a community based on identity of origin of life. It is used of male children of the same parents, male descendants of the same parents, see Acts 7 and Hebrews 7, people of the same nationality, see Acts 3 and Romans 9, any man a neighbor, see Luke 10 and Matthew 5 and Matthew 7, persons united by a common interest, see Matthew 5, persons united by a common calling, see Revelation 22, mankind, see Matthew 25 and Hebrew chapter 2, the disciples, and so by implication all believers, Matthew 28 and John 20. Believers apart from sex, see Matthew 23, Acts 1, Romans 1, 1 Thess Thessalonians 1, Revelations 19. So he says, It is evident, therefore, from the range of possible definitions of Adelphos that Jesus' brothers need not necessarily be siblings of Jesus on linguistic grounds, as many commentators assume. And he goes on to give examples from the King James Version to illustrate his point. In, in the King James Version, Jacob and his uncle Laban are called brothers, and Lot and his uncle Abraham are also referred to as brothers. And to top it off, if we cross-reference, this is what I meant when I say that we need to always keep the whole of Scripture in mind whenever we want to interpret one particular part. The meaning cannot be divorced from the unity of the whole. So by cross-referencing Matthew 2756, Mark 1540, and John 1925, you will see that some of the individuals named as Jesus' brothers, particularly James and Joseph, in Matthew 1355, they are referred to as the Adolphus of Jesus. They are identified as having parents that are not Mary and Joseph. They are the sons of Mary, the wife of Clopas, who herself is called the Adelphi of Our Lady in John 19.25. The Catholic approach to Scripture is the unity of the content. The meaning of the individual parts cannot be divorced from the whole. By isolating the word brother in some Scriptures in order to attempt to prove Catholicism wrong, you are inadvertently pre presenting an interpretation in which James and Joseph have two sets of parents. But if we employ a Catholic interpretive approach, by looking at the unity of the whole, we can look at the whole narrative of the life of Christ and make some certain conclusions by what we see present in the whole. By looking at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story, we see that during the infancy narratives, Mary and Joseph did not have other children. Fast forward to the finding of the child Jesus in the temple, 12 years later, plenty of time to have kids, but still, Mary and Joseph did not have other children. Fast forward to the foot of the cross. You know what Mary did not have next to her at the foot of the cross? Other children. And this is confirmed explicitly when Jesus entrusts her to John. So if we draw a straight line through these stories, through these narratives, it is clear Mary has no other children. Jesus surely had cousins and kinsmen, but there is no explicit evidence of other children. But back to what Dr. Crummett said. Um, so if this was true, you would expect that it would be mentioned. That statement in itself is problematic. Christians believe that scripture is the inspired word of God. The sacred writers wrote what they were inspired to write. But Dr. Crummett seems to suggest here that the writers would have decided for themselves what was important and should be included that they would have written 
not only what they were inspired to write, but every single biographical data point. And if they did not mention it, it must not be true. Um, so if this was true, you would expect that it would be mentioned. Traditionally, Christians believe that God inspired the human authors to write what he wanted written, not what they thought was important. And this is an important point because the gospel itself says that it does not record everything Jesus said and did because the world could not hold all of the books. But Dr. Crummett seems to suggest that the things that weren't recorded were de facto not true. But that would contradict John uh, chapter 21, 25, in which John states that there's a lot more truth, as well as John 16, where Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So according to Jesus' own words, there is more truth that's not mentioned in scripture. There are just a lot of things that you have to believe if you're going to be an Orthodox Catholic. But the spirit of truth will come and guide you into all truth. Is that not what we claim is sacred tradition and the proper understanding of the development of doctrine? That's not what's happening in Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura depends only on the truth present in Scripture. By definition, it excludes whatever truth Jesus is alluding to in John chapter 16. But Catholicism teaches that there is a church that received this truth and then passed it down. And if they didn't, if that's not true, if they did not receive that truth as our Lord prophesied, then how are we having this discussion anyways? We would have never known any of this. The perpetual virginity, the first source we have for it is this book called the Proto-Evangelion of James, which is from like the mid second century. And it's totally incredible. I mean, it's full of things that are obviously not true. The author is lying about who he is. He claims to be James, Jesus' brother, and nobody thinks that that's true. This statement is also problematic. Dr. Crummett references the Proto-Evangelium of James in such a way that some listeners might conclude that the Catholic Church draws her teaching on the perpetual virginity of our Blessed Mother from this particular artifact, and then he discredits that artifact. This is misleading, because Catholics do not draw this teaching from this document. Where do we draw our teaching from? Dr. Crummett says that the first source we have for it is the Proto-Evangelium of James, which dates to the mid-2nd century. This is also not accurate. The first source we have of this teaching is scripture. And Dr. Crummett knows that because he restates our position later when asked by a viewer. All right, Maverick Christian, he says, what of the objection that Luke 134 indicates perpetual virginity of Mary because it uses the continuous present? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, so what, what he's talking about is this is during the Annunciation. So the angel shows up to Mary and says, you're going to become pres uh, pregnant. And she says, how can this be when I am a virgin? Um, and the, the thought is that must be indicating that she has like taken a vow of perpetual celibacy because she's confused about how she could become pregnant in the future. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that makes much sense because it seems like the the clear implication of what the angel says is that like she's going to become pregnant you know in the near future like not, nothing else has to happen right in in the same way that um you know i mean if if somebody like if your wife comes to you and says i'm going to have a baby uh you're not going to be like oh yeah i figured that we were going to have a baby at some point you know you you, you think that means that like immediately in the near future she's going to have a baby um, and I think that that's, that's why Mary is confused. As to be honest here, I'm, I'm confused by the point. This, this marriage analogy would seem to support the Catholic position. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding. But as much as I may be confused, I do take issue with Dr. Crummett calling Our Lady confused, which he does twice in this clip. Just a quick reminder. She was physically united for nine months to the Divine Logos, the source of all truth. She was likely the least confused person ever. I, I mean, if Luke was trying to convey that she had taken a vow of perpetual virginity, there would be much, much easier ways and much clearer ways to say that. You know? Notice that here he does not say that the teaching is not present in the text. Strictly speaking, he's not refuting the teaching, even though he sets out to prove Catholicism is false. Here, he seems to be arguing that the teaching is not present to the degree that he would personally prefer. Play it again. I, I mean, if Luke was trying to convey that 
she had taken a vow of perpetual virginity, there would be much, much easier ways and much clearer ways to say that. You know? He presumes that there are degrees of clarity. And then he says that this teaching doesn't rise to the particular degree that would suit him. But remember, as I already pointed out, the entire book of Exodus apparently also doesn't rise to the degree that he would prefer. Dr. Crummett takes a legitimate interpretation of scripture, one that uses what is known in biblical scholarship as synchronic forms of interpretation, which is, for those of you who are not familiar with met methods of biblical interpretations, this is a mainstream valid method used throughout scriptural scholarship by Catholics and Protestants. Maybe you don't believe this particular interpretation, but that is a legitimate interpretation, which is held by many biblical scholars, which has been taught and passed down by the tradition. St. Augustine famously held this view. History testifies to the fact that vows of virginity were common in the ancient Hebrew culture. There are scriptural references to vows of virginity throughout scripture. Jesus in John 10, Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, Revelation 14. So here is the biblical interpretation the Blessed Mother has taken a vow of perpetual virginity. The angel comes to her and tells her something that would normally, naturally, cause her to violate that vow, prompting the question, how can this be, since I do not know man? Which, as Maverick Christian pointed out, was written in the continuous present tense, indicating a permanent condition. If that interpretation is wrong, if she has not taken a vow, she's betrothed to be married, she's of childbearing age, why would she ask that question, especially using the continuous present tense? Dr. Crummett keeps using the, the word confused when speaking about Our Lady. Confused about what? Again, she's of childbearing age, she's betrothed, the teleology of marriage would normally be a child. The question makes no sense without the vow. If you do not accept this interpretation, then you have the burden to provide some explanation as to why Zechariah was struck dumb because he asked the same question of the same angel on the same page. And unlike Mary, had a valid reason to ask that question because he and Elizabeth were well past childbearing age. But that was the wrong question to ask the God of Abraham and Sarah. It demonstrated a lack of faith on Zechariah's part. So he was struck dumb and if that was a lack of faith for Zechariah, here's the point. If that was a lack of faith for Zechariah, who had a valid question, how much more would Mary's question be a lack of faith? When she would have had no valid question, she had no impediment, she was not too old, she was, she was betrothed to be married, but yet she asked the question, and she's not struck dumb. And... History venerates her, not for being confused, as Dr. Crummett says, but for her great faith. The next words she speaks are called the great fiat. Let it be done to me according to thy word. The greatest act of faith ever, that this child would be born while her vow was honored by a good and faithful God. And that meaning, that truth, is in the text. I didn't make one reference to the Proto-Evangelium of James. I made a valid interpretation of the scripture. Whether I convinced you or not, that's a different matter. But it is a legitimate interpretation that some of the foremost scripture scholars today, alive today, hold. But what did Dr. Crummett say about that? I, I mean, if Luke was trying to convey that she had taken a vow of perpetual virginity, there would be much, much easier ways and much clearer ways to say that. Is that an argument that proves Catholicism false? I think it's clear, because according to the landmark research of Richard Burridge in his What Are the Gospels, he identifies the Gospels as Greco-Roman biography, a biography of Jesus, and not a biography of Mary. Therefore, one would not necessarily expect explicit biographical data about Mary in a text of a biography about Jesus. Oh, there's biographical data there. We've been working with it throughout this entire video. The data is present, but it's not present in the manner which Dr. Crummett desires to find it, nor to the degree. Where is the data? It's present in the narrative, which is why we're employing a, a narrative analysis. 
If you don't use this interpretive method and you treat the Bible like a textbook where you look up separate topics like an index, like what does the Bible say about this or that? What does the Bible say about war? What does it say about taxes? What does it say about the death penalty? You're not going to see data that is present in narrative form. You're treating it like an index of topics. But the gospel is a story. Moving on, I want to address what I think is the most poignant issue in this, this hour-long video. I, I know I did not address his comments about the assumption, but I think I made my point regarding Marian dogmas in general. But this video is already the longest video I've, I've ever made. And I really want to address this, this next issue because I think this is the one that had the biggest impact on Cameron. Dr. Crummett makes, makes some claims, some accusations against the church. And when I play this clip, I want you to pay close attention to Cameron's body language. This is a man who has expressed a true desire to become Catholic. And watch how Dr. Crummett's comments here completely deflate him. As a Catholic, I find this just heart-wrenching. And it's the main reason I decided to make this video. That, that as well as his claim that, that Our Lady was confused. So here's that clip. There's a debate. It's clear the Catholic Church used to preach that it had the ability to direct the state to punish heretics. You know, I mean, I know people who, are, who I guess are heretical Catholic. You know, they were raised Catholic and changed their mind about certain things. I don't think that the state should, like, burn them to death. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, this is a very serious problem, I think. And um, Kevin's view wound up being that, yeah, the... The church's position now roughly is that it doesn't do this anymore, but it still has the right to. Um, and I, I have trouble believing that, and I have trouble believing um, hmm. some of the other ethical regions. Of so the problem with this whole presentation, just, just to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. There, there's no context. Is he, is he talking about the Inquisition? He never says that. So like I said, I, I emailed him, and I, I asked him what he was talking about, and as of yet, I haven't received a response. Perhaps I will. But here's my questions. Is he accusing the church of killing innocent people? And if so, who? And, and when? And how does, how does he know that they were innocent? Or is he accusing the church of playing a role in the state's legitimate administration of the death penalty? If that's the case, he's already inferred that he does not approve of the death penalty, so much so that he's willing to call into question the inerrancy of the book of Exodus. Whatever he's accusing us of, he claims that we changed it and we don't do it anymore, but we retain the right to do so. Kevin's view wound up being that, yeah, the, the church's position now roughly is that it doesn't do this anymore, but it still has the right to. This is such an odd statement for Dr. Crummett to make. I, I, I think he's a philosophy professor, but he says that the church claims to have the right. The church's moral teaching is not based on rights. That's, that's a modern secular concept. The church's moral teaching is and has been based on natural law, which, number one, doesn't change even though, number two, it does account for changing circumstances because change is a part of nature. But more on that in a bit. I'm just wondering, is his personal opinion about the death penalty, is it coloring the way that he's phrasing his accusation? And, and it is an accusation. He's accusing Catholics of killing, burning innocent people. This this, this is the phrase I want to spend some time on. It's clear the Catholic Church used to preach that it had the ability to direct the state to punish heretics. He says that it's clear that the Catholic Church used to preach that it had the ability to direct the state to punish heretics. The prepositional phrase in that sentence is backwards. It's like a sentence constructed by Yoda. And for those who don't know history, that could be very misleading. It would suggest the subject of the sentence, the Catholic Church, had the goal to predicate the death or, or punishment of heretics. The Catholic Church used to preach that it had the ability to direct the state to punish heretics. If we're talking about the Inquisition, that's what I'm going to assume, then that sentence is very problematic. Again, implying that the Church was pursuing the death of innocent people, their goal 
Their goal was to kill people, to burn them at the stake. And then he accuses us of still holding that position. Faithful Bible-believing Christians are secretly praying inside their homes until a Catholic church comes and beats on their door. The template here is, is Jesus praying in the garden when the Pharisees arrest him and take him to the state to be executed. You take that template and you apply it, apply it over the Catholic church and bingo, you have a revolution, a bestseller, a whatever. But in reality, the prepositional phrase should be at the beginning of the sentence. The state was executing heretics. Who had the goal to predicate, to punish? Whose goal was that? The state should be the subject of the sentence. It was the state who was intent on executing criminals. Well then, what's the Catholic Church have to do with the Inquisition? Because of the huge possibility that the state was executing people who were in fact innocent of heresy, the church intervened, telling the state that they did not have the ability, the ability to discern heresy. It was the job of theologians to discern the nuances of theological statements and determine if they were true or not. So the actual intent, the purpose, the goal, the predicate of the sentence was to clear the name of the innocents and pursue the conversion of heretics. For example, the Cathars in southern France, both at the same time, spread a Gnostic heresy and revolted against the, the state. Did the state have just cause to intervene? Did the church have just cause to intervene? You tell me. They believed in two gods, heresy, a good God that had a spiritual nature, and an evil God that had a material nature. So, they concluded that all matter was evil, including the human body. So the goal of their religion was ritual suicide by starvation, which was not just an individual private practice. They forced it on their children, including infant children. They tied up their children and starved them to death so that they could be freed from their material bodies. They tied up their children and killed them. People in southern France did the state have just cause to intervene? Did the church have just cause to intervene? The state did intervene. Ultimately, they had to engage in military action. The church intervened, which they should. They were pastors of these people. So they sent in missionaries, preachers to convert them. St. Dominic and his companions who preached about the goodness of God's creation, the unity of the body and the soul, that Jesus Christ took on flesh, this preaching ministry was accompanied by a prayer ministry. We call this prayer ministry the Rosary. The mysteries of the Rosary relate to the incarnation of Christ, God in the flesh, that matter is good. God became a baby, what, what the Cathars misunderstood, that God became a baby, he was born from a human mother, he endured a passion, he suffered in the flesh, he was crucified, died, and rose from the dead, a bodily, material resurrection, and he saved us through his material body. And there are numerous stories of conversions and miracles that occurred in the ministry of St. Dominic. Were there also abuses in the Inquisition? Yes, because people in the Middle Ages, even Dominicans, were sinners, just like we are. But more on that in a minute. First, Cameron, here are a few facts that I think you should be aware of. In Carl Keaton's Catholicism and Fundamentalism, a, a fantastic apologetics manual, Keating dispels much of the bad research that has gone on in some anti-Catholic circles for well over 100 years regarding the Inquisition. On page 296, he notes that one anti-Catholic source accused Catholics of killing 95 million people during the Inquisition. 95 million! despite the fact that the entire population of all of Europe never reached that number in all of the Middle Ages combined. It never got anywhere close. 
Dr. Crummett very effectively uses the phrase burning at the stake, burning at the stake to elicit an emotional response. But let's take a pause and step back. What are we discussing? What is burning at the stake? What are we discussing? It's the death penalty. And these, and all of these issues that Dr. Crummett has brought up throughout this, this discussion, war, the death penalty, interrogation, he has expressed some reservations about their, about their presence in scripture, so much, willing, so much so that he's willing to sacrifice inerrancy. Now, I agree that these are difficult topics. It's hard to discuss these issues, especially with an atheist who wants to use them as evidence to refute God's existence. So I'm going to try my best here because I do not want to live in a world where terrible things happen. But the fact remains that I do. Crime happens. Injustice happens. Think of what happened this summer in Texas. And after something terrible happens, after some criminal does something awful, it's incumbent upon society to pursue justice. This is important. It would be neglect. It would be an injustice. It would be, it would be a violation of natural law for us to ignore it, to pretend that something terrible did not happen and there were not victims. Now, I did not make this up. I didn't invent the death penalty. I didn't invent war. The truth is that societies have, have been pursuing justice for as long as recorded history. And as uncomfortable as it is for, for our modern sensibilities, justice in many cases has meant capital punishment, war, or interrogation of prisoners. So with all that stated, war and the death penalty are definitely, explicitly taught in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. For example, in Acts chapter 5, St. Peter brings to trial judges and sentences to death in Ananias and his wife. St. Peter sentences both of them to death for lying. And it would seem as though it was a just sentence because an angel or God carried out the sentence. They both dropped dead on the spot. What was that argument against binding and loosening? Now, honestly, I think, as, as in this is my opinion, I think maybe St. Peter might have, might have gone a little overboard. Maybe he lost his temper. Maybe, maybe things escalated a little too far too fast. Maybe he could have used the Snickers. But that's my personal opinion. That's not what Scripture teaches. What does Scripture teach? Scripture teaches the death penalty. Perhaps Dr. Crummett will argue that this scripture is also an error. But on what grounds? Are we just going to tear out every page of the Bible that is difficult to our modern sensibilities? Which brings me to my point about modern sensibilities. The truth of the matter is that the Bible teaches uncomfortable things like war, death, uh, the death penalty. And while that may be uncomfortable for us, it is true that under particular circumstances, they are admissible as ethical under a natural law. So there's no ethical problem with them being present in Scripture. There are circumstances in which they are not ethical to Dr. Crummett's point that this means Catholic moral teaching has changed. This mis misunderstands that natural law does account for varying circumstances because change is a part of nature. For example, it is fitting for me to use a hammer to drive a nail, but it is not fitting for me to use a hammer to cut down a tree. And it would be an abuse of the hammer to use it to cut down the tree. I have a different tool for that job, for that circumstance. And as the moral agent, it is up to me to discern that difference. This is called the act of conscience. If someday in the future they invent a tool like a, like a chainsaw, I still am the moral agent that can still discern the purpose of the hammer is not to cut down the tree. And oh, we do have more humane methods of administering the death penalty besides burning somebody at the stake. And I, as the moral agent, discern, but that doesn't mean that Catholic moral teaching has changed. So be because societies should practice and maintain justice, Natural law does allow for types of punishment in some circumstances as a valid pursuit of justice. Can it be abused? Yes, but the abuse of justice does not negate justice. We don't defund the police because of a few bad cops. 
Can the same be said for tolerating evil? Is tolerating evil ever, in any circumstances, a tenement, a tenant of natural law? This is an important question because the people of the Middle Ages, Christians, felt that they should never tolerate evil. We, on the other hand, we have made it a virtue. And so, so every child in America has access to more filth at the touch of their fingertips than, than presumably all the filth that existed in all of the Middle Ages combined. And we tolerate that because of freedom of speech, because of artistic expression. Is that ethical according to natural law? And how's that working out for us? Is tolerating evil ethical? There's so many modern examples that I could use to illustrate this point. I saw a story in the news while I was writing all of this. A criminal murders someone. They're arrested and then they're, they're released for good behavior or illegal technicality or whatever it was, I don't remember. And immediately, well, you know what I'm, you know I'm going to say, don't you? This is so common in our tolerant society that you know exactly what I'm about to say. He gets out of prison and immediately commits the same crime. He murders somebody else within a few days, I think it was. Is it possible to hypothetically present some data here to illustrate how ridiculous this is? Let's try this. Let's see if, let's see if we can make this point. According to this 2017 article from the Daily Mail, offenders on probation were charged with 382 murders between 2012 and 2016, according to the figures from the Ministry of Justice. This, this data is from England. I tried to get something in Europe. They were also charged with 200 attempted murders, 34 manslaughters, 1,024 rapes or attempted rapes, 134 kidnappings, 54 arson attacks, and 457 other serious sexual or violent offenses. A total of 2,285 violent and sexual offenses. That's the modern justice system under tolerance. So let's compare that very, very specific cherry-picked data, this four-year period in modern England in which there were 416 murders or manslaughters by very specific individuals, criminals, after they released. So it's cherry-picked data. Let's compare that singular data to some of the data from the Inquisitions. And here I'm going to use seven lies about Catholic history. So first, also in England, but between the years 1401 and 1485, 84 years. Four modern years versus 84 Inquisition years. Eleven heretics were burned. How about Italy, the mid-16th to the mid-17th centuries, a hundred-year period. The Venetian Inquisition tried over a thousand cases, and there were four executions. How about the dreaded Spanish Inquisition? That's the one that we all think about when someone mentions the Inquisition. Quote, in the whole of the 16th century, the Spanish Inquisition executed 182 heretics. So who is it that is brutal? Who can truly sit in judgment over the other? Can we truly sit in judgment over them? The truth is that both circumstances are bad. They are both bad because they both had criminals doing bad things. They are both the result of a fallen human nature and both the modern justice system as well as the justice system from the Middle Ages tried to cope with the reality of human nature. But we, who are evil for being tolerant, are superimposing that tolerance upon them? Last point, back to Keating. He makes a very important point that whatever can be said about the Catholic Inquisition can be doubly stated about the Protestant witch hunts, also from the mid Middle Ages. Quote, in Britain, 30,000 went to the stake for witchcraft. In Germany, the figure was 100,000. Such statistics do not make the Spanish execution right, but they perhaps indicate that the severity and punishment was not due to Catholicism as such, but must be attributed to the general character of the times. Dr. Cromit, here there is no contradiction in Catholic moral teaching. According to natural law, legitimate civil governments may justly pursue war and may ethically execute criminals, but they don't necessarily have to because they may have other tools in their toolbox, which may more effectively achieve the goal of justice. 
which should be the prepositional phrase of that sentence. They knocked at the door, okay? And normally, I don't answer the door. But this time, I opened the door. They were Bible Christians. We're gonna call this story, 